Jackson, Afterlife. Once again, Chris Cuomo and Elizabeth Vargas. Good evening and welcome to the second hour of our Michael Jackson anniversary special. We're going to get personal now and begin with three people whose connection to Michael Jackson was hands-on for over 25 years. Only they saw him as he really was in life and in death, without the glamour, without the makeup. Tonight, Cynthia McFadden has their inside stories. These are the people who prepared Michael Jackson during and after life. It was the most private of times for the most public of people. Michael Jackson's family and closest friends had come together at Forest Lawn Cemetery to bid him a final farewell. To prepare Jackson, his family had turned to the three people who'd been dressing him and making him up for more than a quarter century, Dennis Tompkins, Michael Bush, and Karen Fay. Karen, the family called you and asked you to make Michael Jackson up. Yeah. Nobody else could have. How did you do it? It's an honor to do it. It's an honor to do it. I knew how I wanted to do it. So I did. First family, first children. And you all dressed him? Yeah, the family called and said, you've worked with Michael for so many years, we need you to do his outfit. And he'd gone like, okay, if he ever needed me, he needs me now. So what did you pick? Well, the only thing I can say at this point, because the family wanted to, most wants to keep it private. There's elements of everything that was his favorite looks over the years. Everything was new. Were you proud of it? Yes. Mm, very, yeah. very, very. It's beautiful. There had to have been a glove. Mm -mm. No. no. He didn't want that. Well, see, the, the, Michael, the glove was Billie Jean. That represented that song. That wasn't... Not himself. That's not Michael Jean. That's the song. That's my performance. That's Billie Jean. Do you want to put, put on the jacket? jacket? <laughs> and these were people who knew the man behind the music. Michael Bush, you're going to like this. This is you working. Knew him stripped of the artifice he so cleverly showed the world. Unguarded moments captured by Karen Fay. I'm not lit properly. This isn't fair. Oh, that's right. Where's the bounce car? <laughs> ABC News paid to license footage song? and photos from his three friends' private collections. His inner circle was determined. Jackson would exit as the world had known him as a showman. Roy. The work that me and Karen did with Michael <clears throat> at Forest Lawn, I think, bonded us for life. Nine hours, wasn't it? Nine hours. Nine, Nine hours. hours. You didn't know you'd be the actual person to dress him no. the last time. I never expected, that even when we did the costume, <sighs> to do that. I thought, you know, <laughs> hand it through a door, I'm, I'm done. And then I assisted you. And I think the hardest thing is, I mean, they, they ask me to help. Everyone's gone. We, we have to mm. get him in the coffin. So I had to help pick him up and place him in the coffin. And to me, it's like, well, I got to do this for my best friend. The final touch, Tompkins designed this crown to bid the king of pop farewell. May I pick it up? Yes. It looks like ermine down here. It's, it's not real, is faux. it? No. Faux. Faux ermine. <laughs> faux ermine. It's a show crown. <laughs> show crown. <laughs> for perhaps the greatest showman of them all. You can't help but think he would have loved seeing his children proudly carry that crown. When the casket was brought in at Forest Lawn into the service, Prince and Paris and Blanket lifted and put it on the center of the flowers on the coffin. Well, that must have been a moment. It definitely. Yeah. This is the first time Topkins, Fay, and Bush have talked about their employer and friend. So, Karen, tell me about the first time you met him. Um, I met him in the summer of 1982. Just a little bit backwards. She'd been called in to do his hair and makeup for the cover of Thriller, which would become the biggest selling album of all time. And he'd brought along a surprise, a baby tiger. I was more fascinated with that tiger than I was with him. So I think he really enjoyed that my attention wasn't totally focused on him. In fact, a little known fact, you flashed him that first day. <laughs> oh, okay. Mm. I undid the top of my jeans and I just flashed him the tux. I happened to have worn some tiger underwear that day. And he went, ah! And he, yeah. just, he, he was just so embarrassed by that. I quickly buttoned it up. But I think that's why he called me back the next job. You think? I think so. <laughs> he liked people who had a sense of humor. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. He also liked people who had a sense of style. 
For more than two decades, the majority of Jackson's most memorable outfits came out of the workshop run by Dennis Tompkins. If you had to sum up his style, what was it? Liberace has gone to war. <laughs> Liberace has gone to war. Liberace, there you go. And I said that's pretty good. <laughs> his genius as an artist is unquestioned. But we wanted to know about the persistent rumors that followed him. There's been a lot of talk about whether or not he was abusing drugs. Nobody was in a more intimate position than the three of you to, to know. And popular wisdom was that after the Pepsi commercial, mm -hmm. where his hair caught on fire, and he had to take painkillers. That that's point. not true. That's not true. That's not true because that's not where um, <clears throat> it initially started. Faye insists Jackson's use of prescription drugs began in 1993 nine years after the Pepsi commercial. Just before we went on tour for Dangerous, he had an operation in order to help the scarring. But he didn't have enough time to heal. We were getting on a plane and going right to Bangkok. So in order to keep going, he started using some painkillers because it was very painful when the nerve endings are severed. Do you know what he was taking? Oh, no. No, I don't. It wasn't out in the open. It wasn't. No, 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 no. no. But it was while they were in Bangkok, Jackson's world exploded. Police sources say the charges involve a 13-year-old boy. Amidst reports that California authorities were investigating him for sexually abusing a 13-year-old boy. So now we're talking physical pain, and now we're talking emotional pain. The day that, that came out, he was stepping on stage in front of like 80,000 people. Jackson went through with the performance, but the price was high. It was devastating because he had to go out every day in front of a world and the media who was telling Crushing everybody that, that he, would, he was a pedophile, but he still went out and had to face everybody. Aided, Faye says, by painkillers. It gave him some sort of ability to get through it. But even then, Jackson couldn't sleep, say Bush and Faye. And the combined toll of the allegations and touring was showing, at least backstage. You have to understand his adrenaline was so intense. Sometimes it would take him mm -hmm. two days. Two days to go to sleep. For his adrenaline just to come down fr from one show. In 1994, Jackson settled out of court with his accuser. But nearly a decade later, yet another boy came forward also alleging sexual abuse. The most loving thing to do is to share your bed with someone. That remark from a British documentary was so incendiary, it fueled Jackson's prosecution. If you say the word bed, a lot of people think sexual, and that was the farthest thing from Michael's mind. I mean, we would go do an awards show, you come back, everyone jumped on there, with 15 mm -hmm. people on a bed watching yep. the show or uh, cartoons or whatever movie he had to show. You never saw, you never heard anything of the course of a 25-year relationship that made you think that Michael Jackson was a pedophile? No. Nothing. No. Nothing. I absolutely mm -hmm. feel I would have seen something over the years, but not a thing. Not guilty. A dramatic victory for Michael Jackson. And after a three-and-a-half-month trial, Jackson was acquitted, though the taint of the accusation continued to linger. Tonight, for the first time, his friends reveal how devastating the trial was for him. They were there at Neverland every morning getting him ready. Faye says the routine was always the same, beginning at 3 a.m. Before I washed his hair, we actually knelt down on the ground. And he put his arms around me, and I put my arms around him, and he would put his head right here and weep. And we would pray for God to help us and, and for people to know the truth. And then we'd get up and wipe our tears, and I would wash his hair. Do you think he thought he was going to be convicted, Karen? He didn't know. I mean, it was so vicious. He had to walk the red carpet into that courtroom every day in front of all the cameras. And every day for that long walk, he had a new outfit designed by his old pals, delivered every morning at 6 a.m., a boost for his morale. And after you got him dressed, it's like, we love you. No, I love you more. 